Welcome to the LaSalle Wellbeing Show and in this week's episode we are getting some expert advice on what to eat or feed our loved ones when we or they are ill. Now while memory loss and confusion are perhaps the most well-known symptoms of dementia, this neurological disease can also negatively affect a person's ability and desire to eat. And this is something that the nutritionist and Cordon Bleu chef Jane Clark experienced firsthand when her father was diagnosed with the disease in 2006. And saddened to discover that most people with dementia are served pureed, quote, brown mush, she set out to develop a different approach to the eating challenges these people faced, an approach that puts the experience and well-being of the individual first. And it's not just people with dementia that face eating challenges. Those undergoing cancer treatment, for instance, often battle a loss of appetite, uncomfortable bloating, nausea or a sore mouth. And with symptoms such as these, it's easy to give up and turn to sugary snacks or anything that we can grab to get something down us. But in times like these, when we're not well, that is perhaps when we need the transformative power of healthy, fresh food more than ever. Well, Jane truly is the expert go-to for ensuring that everyone has healthy and delicious food to support the body and mind. She's got so many tips for those struggling with eating challenges, including perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, eating disorders as well. So I do hope that you will share this episode widely with anyone currently battling ill health. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on Instagram after the show. And don't forget that if you'd like to watch our chat today, the video podcast is available now also on YouTube. So without further ado, let's hear it from the lovely Jane. So Jane, a really warm welcome. It's lovely to have you here, especially having featured you in the magazine and knowing a little bit about your journey and your background. It's always great, I think, to to bring it to life to listeners and, of course, those who are watching you live here on YouTube. So welcome. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. So can we go back and talk a little bit about your journey? Because I think it's quite unusual to have a nutritionist who's also a Cordon Bleu chef. You know, I think a lot of nutritionists come at, come at things from a purely, perhaps theoretical, biomedical angle. Presumably, did you come into this world through your love of food and eating? I did. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was. It was. Yes, I'm sort of a bit um, the opposite way around, as you say. My sort of my whole upbringing was my great auntie, who was a great cook. So for me, she was the ideal aunt that you always wanted to stay with. So I saw food as love and affection. And then my dad, who is very relevant to what I'm now doing, um, in those days he's he was a chemistry teacher. So he sort of had this passion for science in our house. So I had my passion for science, but the big overriding one was my auntie. So I was mm. a big passionate foodie right from the beginning. And your father obviously is, is really integral to your journey, isn't he? Because did you train as a nutritionist first before then helping your father? Yes. Yes, I did. So I went to university and did my dietetic degree. I actually knew someone who was a dietitian, um, even though clinically now I actually, I am a dietitian, but I call myself a nutritionist because Mm. I think we have this misconception that dietitians are all about diet sheets and minimalism and sort of abstemious, but I was a big foodie. So I did my dietetic degree, set up my practice when I was 25, having done my cordon bleu training. Mm -hmm. um, And dad wasn't diagnosed until about... 15 years later, after I'd already been looking after patients for many years. I think that's a really interesting distinction. And actually, for for listeners, it might be helpful here just to clarify what the difference is between a dietitian and a nutritionist. I think it's it's a particularly worrying difference because if you're a dietitian, you have to have done your four year degree and to do diplomas on type on top of that. So it's a really sort of strict medical evidence all of that sort of reassurance at the at the base of our education. Um, but then nutritionists can be anyone. You know, that's yeah. shocking. So you can have just done a two-hour course. You can call yourself a nutritionist. I am not at all saying that all nutritionists aren't qualified. Sure. But for everyone to know that actually you have to be really careful. Yeah. Because I often say to my patients, who I look after day in, day out, is that I can get things really right. 
Mm. But also we know that if we get it wrong within our bodies, there are consequences. So it's really Absolutely. important that you see someone or listen to the advice from someone who's properly educated. That is really very relevant. And I guess, you know, asking people about their qualifications and experience and specialisations. And I know actually through having treated various members of my family, my children included, very much with nutritional therapy on a on a clinical level, you know, under the direction of both GPs, but also working with nutritionists, uh, you know, very qualified in their areas and how important it is because the nuances of, of nutrition are extraordinary, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And I give this a really good example that um, with a type of, albeit it's a quite an old fashioned antidepressant called an MAOI, um, people can take that without actually knowing the actual name of it. If I then recommended that they possibly need, needed some some iron or some something that was really sort of good quality chocolate, that they wanted a sweet taste, but they didn't want the sugar in it, mm. within it. If it was a dark chocolate, I could cause a brain injury by that. Oh my goodness. Because it interacts with the medication. Or right. I look after a lot of patients with undergoing cancer treatments. There are certain cancer treatments that you can't have grapefruit and you can't have cold yeah. food and it interacts. So it's yes. really important that, yes, we think food is a really lovely thing and it's great to keep that sort of inspiration level. But right at the root of it, we're talking about someone's well-being. Mm. I've heard that there's a link actually just picking up on that. Is it grapefruit and antihistamines? Yes. Oh, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? I guess it's, it's an, an enzyme in grapefruit that can interact with certain medications. It can, yeah. So you have to get it really right. And, yeah. and so you need to be really getting the wisdom from someone who's properly qualified. Mm. Well, we've got you here today, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> let's talk about your father and let's talk about dementia. And, you know, sadly, we're seeing such increasing numbers. And I know many listeners with elderly parents are, are having to face this. What role does nutrition and, and your food and feeding him play in your life and, and, and his? Huge roles. Um, from a personal perspective, it is the way I can connect with my dad. And he now is very sadly in the end stage of his life. And like many people living with dementia, swallowing is affected. And... It's because basically the the way that the brain I'm not there of course there are different types of dementia but for many people living with dementia the body forgets how to swallow. Does it really? And yeah, and it's it's a horrible thing to see your loved one go through because swallowing is integral to everything, you know. Mm. And we all know that whether we're looking after children or with my dad, if he's not eating. You know, for me, I feel like I'm failing him as a daughter. Yeah. And so from an emotional perspective, for me, it's the way that I feel like I'm doing something that supports him. Mm. And for my other patients and my dad as well, if we're looking at maybe a stage of dementia that is earlier on, it's something I can take control of. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we actually are seeing some fascinating research around what we can do to reduce the risk of dementia, what we can do to actually hopefully slow the progression of the dementia. And also with the different physical changes, whether it's swallowing, whether it's fatigue, whether it's loss of appetite, those are things I can make a real tangible difference for my dad mm. and for my patients. That's amazing. And let, let's break that down into the three steps then. So for people who want to prevent and, you know, I'm thinking of my, my own elderly parents. They're in their 80s and they're fit and well and, and, you know, seem to have all their faculties. What should I be saying to them? And, and you know, anybody listening here getting into their later years, what are the main nutrients that we should be focused on? Is there any evidence to suggest that certain things can help ward off dementia? There is definite evidence that we can reduce our risk. I think right. what we need to be really careful of is that anyone like myself living with dementia in my family, the last thing people need is guilt. So we are not saying, as with many things in life, that if you do X, it always guarantees a result. But what we do know, Liz, is that a big part of dementia in its sort of disease state is about inflammation. Mm -hmm. And we do know that if we get enhanced inflammation within the body, 
that increases our risk of dementia as it does with certain types of cancer, heart disease. So therefore, from a nutritional perspective, what we need to do is reduce inflammation. And as we talked about in the article is it's about there are certain nutrients like omega threes. Mm. So that's your good sort of oily fish, your walnuts, your hemp, and they can reduce inflammation within the body. And also what you need to do is you want to try and protect the blood vessels and the blood, the organs within our body by building up certain nutrients like antioxidants. So you know, antioxidants, we sort of bat this, this term around, but actually what does it mean? It actually means that it's certain types of foods that we take in within the body that actually can protect our body from oxidation, which is what we see with aging, mm. what we see with disease state, what we see with frailty generally. So if we can build up our antioxidant levels within our body, and fascinating actually, the Japanese are really ahead with this, they say we should be having 12 portions of vegetables and fruits in our daily diet, which is huge. Because of the antioxidants. Yes, because of the antioxidants. Mm. It's that simple thing. And actually what it's really clever is that if you get different colours within different new, different foods, you're getting a different antioxidant. So that's why we say the lovely blueberries, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the apples, the oranges. Shop with your eyes. Right. So if you're getting different colours that means you're getting different antioxidants. And then, of course, we've got clever nutrients like turmeric, garlic, ginger. They reduce inflammation. And then perhaps the last area that is really important to focus on is what we refer to as our microbiome. Now, our microbiome, in essence, are our good, friendly bacteria in our gut. And we do know that if we look after our guts, build up that microbiome, that reduces our level of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So there are three or four cup, you know, things that yeah. all of us can focus on and therefore we reduce our risk of inflammation and therefore hopefully reduce our risk of dementia. Mm. What about the link with sugars and inflammation? And, you know, I've noticed with some of the elderly people that I've known in my life, been close to, I'm thinking of my, my grandparents particularly, they seem to develop a really sweet tooth. And, you know, there was always a biscuit tin. There was always a jar of boiled sweets. There was always, you know, chocolate around, you know, and kind of not good quality dark chocolate, but kind of, you know, junk chocolate. Um, and they seem to rely more on that, actually, as, as they get older. And yet I'm also aware of studies that, that link sugars with inflammation. So definitely there is a link between what we call sort of high glycemic foods. So those refined, horrible sugars. And they actually disturb the microbiome. And that's why we get that link between high sugar, horrible uh, sugars and the microbiome and inflammation. What's interesting, though, about someone who's aging is that the palate changes. So their taste buds change. So they start to crave certain things. And so therefore, they're wanting that sweet satisfaction. Mm. But also what we notice with dementia is that there's definitely, and we're in the early stage of the research here, there's a real craving for sweet things. And there's a lovely story actually when my dad was still able to live at home and they would come over to me every weekend, my parents, and it would normally be a Sunday. And so that was the routine they got into. And But on this particular weekend, there was a great cricket match on. And so I rang dad, he picked up the phone and I said, dad, you know, I really, my dad's a big cricket fan. And I said, look, there's a great cricket match coming on this afternoon. How about you and mum come over and we sit and watch cricket? And dad said, oh no, you know, I just, oh, no, 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 too far. Um, and said, well, dad, it'd be really lovely to see you. And no, 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 I'll check with your mum. No, 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 definitely not coming over. And I said, look, dad, I've got your favourite Dave and Warner cake within a flash. You know. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Bribery. So, you know, absolutely, you know, and, um, and you know, it's a, it's a lovely anecdote I will hold on for all of my life. You know, my dad, if I can dangle a piece of cake or a drink as I'm now, you know, in front of him, because his body is just, is in essence, you revert to, in its beauty, like a child. You know, I've got an 18 year old daughter and yeah. sweet foods are love and affection. So, mm. But we, we do see with almost every patient I look after, and I do that now remotely, you know, via Skype mm -hmm. and FaceTimes, is there's a massive sweet craving. 
So what we need to do nutritionally is to make sure that life doesn't become one big piece of cake, you know, because we do know we get our sugar ups and our lows. So it's about how do we bring that lovely bit of sweetness, but then maybe as I do make the cakes with dates, figs, wholemeal flour, Mm -hmm. you know, different levels of good oils within that. So you slow the absorption of the sugar down into the body. So their body then doesn't get exposed to too many of the bad sugars. Mm. One of the things that I did uh, recently with with my my folks actually was to try and get them off that early bowl of cornflakes and kind of sugar spike really early in the day or, you know, toast and jam or whatever and just say, you know, why don't you just try having eggs or, you know, a bit of avocado on sourdough or something just just to just to switch it because it's such a traditional thing, isn't it? We're so brought up by you know, Mr. Kellogg's and the rest to have, you know, a good bowl of cereal or, you know, nice lots of, you know, toast with honey or, you know, something like that. But that is going to spike, isn't it? Your sugar's quite early on. And I have read some research that shows that once they spike early, it's then harder to regulate later in the day. It is because you then get, we all know you get that quick fix and then you get the crash and then the body goes, but I need some more of it. So that's Mm -hmm. why as you say, if you can introduce the the sweetness later on in the day. But also trick is to introduce the sweetness after you've had protein within a meal. Right. Because that slows down the absorption, so therefore that slows down any potential crashes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's those little tricks of what do we need to put within foods that give you the joy but then don't give you the penalty after. Right. (laughs) That's a very good analogy. And you then went on to develop a whole range of nutritional drinks Tell us about that. Did that come from your own experience with your father? Yes, it came from my experience with my dad. Also with my young patients. I look after young patients living in different stages of illnesses. So I do a lot of work with palliative care with young young children. And so I saw from a parent's perspective, from a daughter's perspective, and also a practitioner perspective that I've looked after patients 30 years. And until I... uh, organize the, the drinks range all we had was big pharma horrible plastic bottles when you looked at the drinks when someone's in need of nourishment sometimes as I said it's hard to swallow so eating is difficult or with a teenager with an eating disorder and they don't want to mm. sit down to a meal but up until that point you only had what was really produced by the massive um, it's very stuff yeah. and, and a lot Ooh. of sugar again and it's known as a chemical diet, you know, the chemical Oof. drinks, which is horrible. Yeah. I, you know, I never yeah. wanted it for my dad. I don't want it for anyone. No. So I actually met up with a really dear friend of mine called Micah Carhill. And those lovely days when we actually had the gorgeous meetings, you know, gosh, mm-hmm. how we miss them. Yeah. And I said, Micah, and Micah was involved in the creation of Green and Black's chocolate. Oh, really? Yes. Ah, yeah. So excellent. I met with Micah <laughs> and he... I said, look, I want to create a drink that is made with all organic ingredients. When you look at the list of ingredients, it doesn't look Mm. scary. You recognize everything. It's not in a plastic bottle. You know, they're in a Tetra Mm -hmm. pack. You know, I didn't want environmentally to be putting anything out that would have a horrible Mm. tail to it. Um, So I wanted to create the drink that also... And this, I mean, actually, it was over ice cream that I attracted my patron, Prue Leith. You know, she's an amazing supporter for us. Yeah. She made the drink into ice cream. You can literally oh, just wow. pour it into a, really? an ice cream maker, nothing added. And you make a nutritious ice cream. Yeah. How yeah. incredible. Yeah. So That's in those genius. moments when, you know, yeah. as you'll see the sun shining through, it's a blistering day. Sometimes you just want that refreshing, mm-hmm. but it's got the vitamins, the minerals in. And, it, you know, that's what's been really I'm exciting. I'm going to try that with my kids, you know, because they, they love ice cream. And, you know, we have ice cream at home and I keep, you know, just really plain cones in, in, in the cupboard. Um, so, you know, to actually give them something that will be a bit of nutrition along the way. Yes. Amazing. And presumably you have a chocolate flavour, seeing as you've worked with somebody from Green and Blacks. <laughs> I do. I have the chocolate flavour, which can either be made into the chocolate ice cream or yeah. you can then warm it up and have a hot chocolate. Nice, nutritious and, hot chocolate. Yeah. So are, are they designed sort of as meal replacements? Would you have that alongside food or instead of? How, how does it work? So it really depends what you're wanting from the drink. So some people use them as a meal alternative. Mm -hmm. So I've got busy mums on the go that have the drink um, because they're more worried about what they put inside their child's body and we're all short of time. So they have it as a a lunch or a breakfast or um, as my dad actually 
likes to have now is he loves his vanilla one with a little shot of whiskey. So it's a bit like a Bailey's equivalent. Oh, wow. <laughs> over, you know, over ice. So he, other patients use them and we've got cyclists, we've got horse riders using them in between. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you can use them as a lovely refreshing smoothie base or nice. in ice cream. So you can use them either as a meal replacement or yeah. alongside. Are they all meal. sweet or do you have savory ones as well? So at the moment we just have the sweet. Mm -hmm. um, but actually what you'll notice with the chocolate, it, I was really keen to use a cocoa powder that didn't have too much sweetness in it because I like that sort of slightly bitter, tangy. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's, it, they're not too sweet. And do you work with, you know, young adults particularly? I'm thinking of the rise in eating disorders, particularly with young women. You yeah. know, a, a, is this something that would be really helpful? Are they d designed to be quite calorific? So they are going to boost you up nutritionally? Yeah, absolutely. And I had, I received a lovely email the other day from a, a mum whose daughter, um, as in as is many uh, a parent's nightmare at the moment, is that yeah. we've sadly known that during COVID, we've seen a 48% increase oh, in referrals shocking. and admissions yeah. for teenagers yeah, into eating disorder for, for teenagers, yeah. the damage it's horrendous. that done, yeah. I, I mean, some of it, it irrevocable. I mean, it's just yeah. extraordinary. My, my younger daughter is at uni and got very involved with, with mental health and she's talked about her own issues. So it's kind of, yeah. it's a very live issue for us here as a family. And it's it absolutely shocking how, how oh it is you know and I this mum was she was heartbroken because she mm -hmm. actually went with her daughter to casualty in a real state you know it takes a lot mm, to actually God, go yes. to, for that next step yeah and all they were shown and this is me not you you know me Liz I'm not knocking the NHS yeah. but they were just given a be happy website address. <gasps> And said, you know, your daughter's not bad enough to be admitted. So basically what you're as a mum, my daughter's 18, they were yeah. turned away and they said, look, you have to get worse. And I got this heart-wrenching email from this mum just saying without nourished drinks, her mother, her daughter wouldn't be here. And that's, yeah. you know, that, that's just the sad reality of where we are. And mm. so it was really you know, it was heartbreaking for me to read that. And that's why we need to be getting the word out there that for, for parents of teenagers who are going yeah. through eating issues, this could just be a way forward. And just mm. that, you know, mm. let's go for slowly, slowly. It could be a mouthful of something. It could be a little bit of the drink that could just give them the nutrients in to just help their mental well-being. One of the things that really helped Brella actually was do, um, finding out that she didn't process vitamin D. Um, well or at all actually yeah. uh, so she you know she's on high strength vitamin d and that has dramatically you know been transformational for her do you add extra vitamins to to the drinks and are there specific ones that you really focus on so we do add vitamins and minerals to them so that they have all 28 essential vitamins and minerals in what's really important is that they are at safe levels for anyone that wants to use them either as an alternative to a meal or they want to use them alongside other foods because mm -hmm. we do know vitamin D is a really good example. We know that being really replete in vitamin D is vital, but we also know that if you have too many yeah. of other vitamins and minerals, that can be toxic for people. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I look after a lot of patients living with dementia and going through treatments also for cancer. And we know that if you if you're undergoing radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, you have to be really careful that you don't put anything inside the body that could really fight against the, the cancer treatment. So our drinks are purposely designed that if you are going through treatment, they're perfectly safe. And that's really important yeah, because absolutely. you don't want to do anything that would really sort of um contraindicate what your medics yeah. are telling you what what sort of nutrients would you need to be mindful of if you're going through those kind of treatments well we were talking earlier about antioxidants mm. and so we know that good levels of antioxidants within foods are really beneficial within the body but we do know there are many many studies that if you mega dose on any of the antioxidants like vitamin c vitamin E um, or the beta carotenes, all the antioxidants, you, you can't take high levels of them because they can interfere with the 
with the cancer treatment. Right. Um, and also, if you're undergoing radiotherapy, you have to be careful that you're not taking in green tea or green tea extract and certain um, things like milk thistle and different herbs and things like that, yeah. because they can actually damage the way that the body is re- re- yeah. sort of reacting to the cancer treatment. Well, I mean, a lot of these herbs and and uh, nutrients do have a therapeutic value, which is kind of why many people use them. So therefore, I guess it stands to reason that there could be a potential interaction yes. with something else. Let, let's let's move on and talk about cancer patients because actually, you there's an amazing interview up on your website with a young uh, guy. I think is it Chris Riley? Who was he? Twenty nine when he was diagnosed with stomach cancer, yes. and he came to see you. Talk us through that story because that is really fascinating for somebody oh, younger. Yeah, Chris is phenomenal. He he's as as you'll read and I've read in the article. You know, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Um, at a time in his life where, you know, 28, 29, mm-hmm. you'd never even, you know, that would be your worst nightmare for anyone. Yeah. And yeah. sadly, again, during COVID, I'm seeing more and more of these cases come through because mm-hmm. the GPs are not seeing people, they're not able mm-hmm. to see them. So like Chris, you know, it was a very stage four. Um, and he was recommended to me by his oncologist who was a real forward thinking oncologist, thank goodness, because there are also oncologists out there that say, oh, it, you know, doesn't matter, you know, eat anything. You know, I've had (laughs) patients, you know, thankfully not Chris, he wasn't told that, you know, awful advice of, you know, go and have all the fast food and the junk, have anything, you know, it's awful that that's been out there. Uh, But Chris was different. His oncologist said, right, you know, we've got to fight with everything. So, Mm -hmm. Right from the early stages, we started looking at everything he puts inside his body. For him and his fiance Ellie, who are a phenomenal couple, they said, right, we're going to, you know, we're going to take control over something. Because they were having to have all the, the toxic treatments. Sure. Because it really, again, yeah. against everything that he stood for. You know, Chris was a real fitness bunny, a cyclist. Um, and he said, right, let's look at that. You know, so we looked at every food he put inside his body, all the remedies, all of that. And, you know, he's doing phenomenally well because no one actually really talks about the fact that so many people who don't make it through the cancer treatments are because they're too weak. So for Chris, he was able to be, we were working, you know, in in line with every therapy he was going through and saying, right, what are the foods that we need for your body to really get through this? Wow. How important is it to look after your liver during treatment like that? Because that's such a key organ, isn't it, of of elimination and detoxification? Yes. And again, it's one of those lists that they don't really talk about. You know, it's only ever talked about when you're at a stage in your cancer diagnosis, if it hits your liver and then it's all the enzymes go offline and then we're, you know, we're really up against a tide. Um, But we know that the liver is our main filtering organ. And f- mm. for anyone going through any treatment, if we don't look after our liver, the liver enzymes can start misbehaving. That shows that your liver is under stress. And therefore, that can really stop um, the progression within the treatment. So often, oncologists have to say, look, your liver's not strong enough for us to put more chemicals inside your body. So really? for Chris, it was absolutely paramount importance. So it is for everyone. And what kind of things would you do to support the liver? So one of them is, I mean, we're looking certainly into intermittent fasting. So mm. um, for a lot of patients, we do intermittent fasting. That could be an 18, 20 hour fast. So like every organ in your body, you're giving it a break. Um, so that you're literally, obviously, the important thing is to keep hydration. But then it's allowing the liver to recover. It can also be certain foods like carrots, fennel, celery are phenomenal for your liver. So it can be juicing, but equally some people can't stomach the juices. So you could do that lovely Persian thing of a plate of lovely raw vegetables Mm. before you have um, a meal, or it could be late afternoon, or it could be just lovely big bowls of salad. So it's that lovely sort of raw element, but also that you don't want to overload with fats of any sort. So we tend to think sort of the animal fats are bad, which isn't the case, but lots of people think that. But even olive oil, avocado oil, they can be too heavy on the liver. So sometimes you just want to take the levels of those down. Interesting. What do you think about fasting with juices? I mean, a lot of people, you know, will talk about juice fasting, particularly for for cancer treatments, you know, extremely controversial. And I'm, I'm no expert in this. What's your view? 
I think it, it, they can be incredibly effective. But what you have to be really careful of is that you don't deplete the body. So we know, you know, everyone is different. You know, if you're diagnosed with cancer early on and you're reasonably fit and robust, then doing juicing, fasting can be one of the first things that we do because it really sort of, it's almost like shutting off your computer, restarting, it reboots the body. Right. Um, but then if someone's diagnosed with cancer when they've been really unwell for a long time, then that can be a point where to do juicing and fasting can be really potentially dangerous for them because they can be so de re depleted that we need to start building those pillars of nourishment before we start any of the fasting. But it can be really useful, but I would say you have to really do it carefully under the guidance yeah. of someone like myself. Yeah, excellent. Jane, there's so much there, and I know that your website is just full of so many great resources and, and helpful bits of information for all stages. I mean, I, I, I love looking at it and reading your blogs and, you know, from every age, whether it's it's young people with supporting them through mental health and potentially through eating disorders, boys as well as girls. I'm sure you're, you're yeah, seeing definitely. both both sexes now um, affected through, you know, middle life, perhaps having to cope with some kind of uh, trauma or some illness such as cancer. And then, of course, hopefully we're all going to grow old and age and age well you know, taking a lot of that advice on board is, is just so useful. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to seeing your brand go from strength to strength and hopefully, you know, influencing and helping lots of people. Pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. Well, so interesting. Big thanks to Jane. And that is it for today's episode. As always, you will find the links and the resources that we mentioned over on lizardwellbeing.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the URL just by the comment section. And over on my website, you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter because this is literally jam-packed with healthy recipes and lots of tips for living well at every stage of life. Huge thanks to all of you who have left us such lovely reviews, especially on iTunes. It really does help others to find the show as well as clicking the little five-star review buttons at the end of this recording. So until the next time we chat, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Go well. Bye-bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with production by Amaryllis Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, assistant researcher, Martha Comerford, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.